Hello, I'm Donovan Bigelow, and this is a, the final lecture on adolescent development. I want to talk now for a while about first adolescent psychopathology, the variations on that theme, and finally want to wrap it up with some discussion of psychotherapy. If there's a problem, psychopathology, what's the best approach to fix it, psychotherapy. But first, and this, I may have mentioned this before, but I think at this stage of the game I have to reiterate um, something that's, that may be more important than anything else I say today, and that we have to be careful with this material because it's almost impossible not to hear the therapist blaming or accusing or finding fault with the parents. Um, there's no way around that. It just, every parent who's so sensitive to what their children are doing cannot help but themselves very frequently blame themselves for things that are going wrong and are hypersensitive because of their own self-accusation to anything that they perceive as criticism from the outside. Frequently when a therapist is making comments about what a child is doing and why, the parents almost immediately close down because they hear things that sound to them like criticism. It is particularly painful and poignant because any, even if it isn't, if it's heard that way by the parent, what happens is the parent's own sense of guilt, often unconscious, is evoked at very in very powerful and very painful ways. So I want to make as clear as, as humanly possible before I move on to the content of these lectures that the overwhelming purpose here is to not blame or point fingers or find fault. It is, however, to help parents and their adolescents experience what's happening in their families and recognize a level of responsibility, a level not just of responsibility, but the whole point of these lectures is to provide the parents and the adolescents, I think, with the material, with the understanding, with the ideas that will help them take responsibility. And if there have been problems in the past, then fix them, repair the damage. What, what cannot happen is we, we cannot begin the blame game because if that starts, then the parents can blame the grandparents and the grandparents can blame, blame the great grandparents. And at some point, we either got to go back to Darwin or Adam and Eve, and that's just not just frustrating, it's utterly useless. So please, as you listen to this section in particular, though I will be describing etiology, cause of psychopathology, as generated in a particular family dynamic or particular family dynamics, the overwhelming desire I have in this material is to simply give parents the tools, the way of thinking about their adolescents' behaviors, give the adolescents a way of understanding their behaviors that gives them power. That's what it's about. Recognizing the truth of what's going on, taking responsibility for your actions, whether you're a parent or an adolescent, and doing so in a way that actually increases everyone's capabilities, power, skill sets, understanding, and the ability to deal in reality in an effective, adaptive way. All of this will make everyone's life better. That's the purpose here. The purpose of these lectures is to help everyone make their lives better, not to assign blame, not to evoke guilt. So, okay, this is the central element in the achieving of that has to do with the distinction between reality and subjectivity. And I want to I want to spend just a minute describing if I can, an approach to truth that isn't about blame. It's about just recognizing the truth as a necessary, absolutely necessary prerequisite to fixing anything in a troubled adolescent's life. And let me step back for a minute. The idea of truth in our modern, sort of postmodern society has gotten a bad rap. It's almost as if everyone thinks that their own subjective opinion is as good as anybody else's anymore, or that there is no truth. There's only a socially constructed reality, and we can pretty much do whatever we want, and that's just fine. No is the answer to that issue. There is a reality, there is a truth, and a way of thinking about that uh, that is useful and helpful uh, is the bedrock upon which all of these lectures sit. So let me 
Let me quote a little bit from Robert Caper, one of the great current American psychoanalytic thinkers. He's uh, summarizing Wilfred Bion's ideas about truth. Um, it is also crucial, he says, in his book, Building Out Into the Dark, it is also crucial to distinguish between legitimate interpretation, which is meant only to convey information to the patient about himself, and suggestion or propaganda, which is meant to alter the patient's mind in some specific and directed way. The magic words works its effect on the mind regardless of the truth of what is being suggested. Okay, what he's saying here is that words have power and that we have to be careful that the purpose of therapy, and I'm going to suggest the purpose of the parent in raising an adolescent to healthy adulthood, is to help them develop their own minds, to help them, and I'm going to come back to this later, find an element of their true self and help them avoid the the construction of a false self, which inevitably happens when society, parents, impinge on the child's natural developmental growth when the needs of the child aren't actually met adequately from the child's developmental perspective, when the circumstances of the parent impose on the child the necessity of complying with the parent's demands instead of, instead of developing their own potential. Okay. These two crucial, back to Caper, these two crucial distinctions converge around the issue of truth. To what degree are analysts able to perceive the truth about their patient, and to what degree are they able to let that truth exist unmolested, to simply describe it without attempting to sell the patient a cure? I have previously suggested that a psychoanalytic interpretation should not be an attempt to cure the patient of anything except perhaps unconscious self-deception. It should only be a communication about the patient's state of mind. Now this is an astonishing thing, folks. If a parent can simply interact with a child in a way designed with what I call benevolent curiosity to understand what's going on in the child's mind. We have a developmental situation that is that opens up the possibility of healthy development. If the parent's primary concern is control, if the parent's primary concern is compliance with rules, if the parent's primary concern are their own needs being met and not those of the adolescent, we have a situation where truth is impossible. Back to Caper. The truths that emerge in an analysis are not difficult to understand once we see them but they are difficult to see because they have been obscured. The truth is generally evident if nothing interferes with our view of it. That is a big if, however, and it is highly unlikely that we can ever evade such interference, such, evade such interference completely. This is just a way of saying that there is such a thing as the truth, that we are able to perceive it, but that our perception is, of it is always imperfect. That is one of the most profound things I have ever seen. We get people who argue a, a radical subjectivism. And, you know, it's just my way of doing things, and my way is just as good as your ways. And the answer to that is, of, that's ridiculous. Of course it isn't. And every parent knows that there's a right way and a wrong way to raise their children. They certainly see the wrong way happening all around them all the time. Any honest look at a baby, an infant, a toddler, a young child, and an early adolescent it is patently obvious to anyone with the courage to see that there are particular developmental dynamics that have to be addressed. That it makes a difference how you raise your child, and it makes a difference to the child's life whether you go too far away from the truth. Now, the answer of the subjectivists, the postmodernists, those who follow sort of French philosophy in some ways, say, well, there's no absolute truth. Therefore, it has to be more or less subjective. No one can prove the absolute truth. This argument's been going on for several thousand years. And to one degree, they're correct. We cannot know. I think the majority of psychoanalytic therapists and therapists generally today are in agreement that no one has a lock on absolute truth. No one's claiming that. But the alternate conclusion, that there's no truth worth pursuing, is equally invalid. All I'm suggesting is that we, we follow Caper and Beyond's idea that there is a truth out there. There is a reality. Freud called it the reality principle, 
which simply means that there's a reality that we have to address. Wood is hard. I'm sitting in this chair. I have a certain body. I need air, food, and water to live. These are realities. I have a certain genetic makeup. These can't be denied. To deal with them psychologically is necessary if we're going to develop any kind of healthy existence. So the answer to this question, and it's essential to avoid, it's essential that we understand that there is a truth and our goal as parents and as adolescents trying to become adults is to move toward that truth as best we can. We don't have to be perfect. We have to be good enough. That is, again, a very high standard. And we ought to be able, if we have adequate courage, to discern the truth of our children's developmental needs, the truth of our own developmental needs, which is a prerequisite to our being healthy parents. So I, I want to I I clear the air a little bit. The fundamental stance of this material is that there are developmental necessities which parents must understand and achieve if their children are going to be healthy. Pathology equals the failure to do that. The reasons for that failure lie in the parental dynamics and the grandparent parental dynamics, and back we go to ancient history. But we don't have to go that way very far, because the truth is it's all right here, right now. And all we have to do is understand it, and all we have to do is make the changes necessary to meet the needs. If we didn't before, then we didn't before. We don't have to blame. We have to understand that we didn't. We cannot pretend that we did. That's the key. There is a truth about child and adolescent development. There's a truth about our own development as adults that, that if we deny it, if we don't have the strength to see the truth of it, if we are in denial effectively of these things, then our children are in grave danger. There will not be improvement in their development. And the the stuff will unfortunately then simply roll downhill. Um, there's an idea, the intergenerational transmission of trauma, that the grandparents, the parents, the children, the grandchildren, they end up repeating this pattern of neglect and pathological development generation after generation. And it's so obvious now that that is true that it's painful. So our job, ladies and gentlemen, and adolescents listening to this, is to stop that cycle, to stop that intergenerational transmission of trauma. And it doesn't matter how it got started. And it doesn't matter what you did or your parents did. What matters is where we are right now, the here and now, understanding the truth of it and moving aggressively as we can, reasonably and in a way that's reality-based, to fix the problems. OK. I hope that makes sense. I hope that clears the table of any hint that there is blame or accusation or fault finding here. That is not the case and, and, and cannot be because that simply isn't very useful. All right. So I would like to, one more preliminary uh, issue before we get in to the details of psychopathology. It seems that we need to discuss a couple of the, the overarching themes. Um, and I think most psychopathology in adolescence, and frankly most people, can, can be looked at as, as anxiety that is uncontained in a particular way. And all the different labels that we describe in the diagnostic manual now uh, of different styles of mental illness seem to generally be uh, explainable in terms of uncontained anxiety that manifests itself in different ways. This happens because there seems to be a structural deficit in the, in the sense of self, the identity, the ego, however you want to describe it uh, theoretically. There isn't enough strength in the internal sense of self to manage the internal experience of anxiety as well as the external experience of life's difficulties that always throw anxiety at us. So I have another quote from uh, a Winnicottian, uh, an analyst that follows D, uh, Donald Winnicott's thinking, uh, called, uh, her name is Barbara Docker Drysdale. And she, she comes up with a, a couple of paragraphs that I think are necessary to situate the whole discussion of psychopathology. She's discussing a, a young patient, an adolescent named Jane. 
uh, quote, nobody except Jane seemed to be violent in her family constellation. Actually, there was plenty of hidden violence, especially between her parents, who, although they never had rows, used Jane as a vehicle for their secret rages with each other. Jane acted out their fury. Deprived children will expect us, the therapists, to behave like their parents. It is an awful thought that, however unconsciously, we may fulfill these expectations. I say unconsciously, but after but after all, the unconscious is part of the person for which one must ultimately accept responsibility. The, th the therapist working with integrated children depends on transference phenomena and on verbal interpretation within the strict limits of the therapeutic hour. The therapist working with unintegrated children must depend on personal involvement, on symbolic actions, and on establishing communication in place of acting out. What she's saying here is that depending on the nature of the pathology, depending on its, on its severity, less severe children have some sense of integrated identity. And therefore, a kind of intervention uh, by the therapist will, will help. The, to the more severely disturbed children, to the more severely disturbed adolescents, there's a different kind of intervention. It's still grounded in very carefully thought through and strict boundaries within the, the therapeutic hour, but it does take a little more recognition of the human element. This isn't an intellectual exercise. Most therapists aren't teaching adolescents how to do things. Uh, I suppose there's some role for that, but the fundamental purpose of therapy with disturbed adolescents is to help them get their de derailed developmental identities back on track, to help them grow their selves stronger and more adaptively. That requires the presence of a therapist who him or herself has done that work for themselves and can then provide an, an internalization of that healthier self to the adolescent that's central to good therapy. It's not so much what the therapist says. It's not so much what they teach cognitively. It's actually a presence of a healthy self, which the adolescent may not have had enough of, that is taken in that provides the core of the therapeutic experience. Okay, back to Docker Drysdale. We have used two factors only in assessing the degree of integ integration. These have been panic and disruption. Again, what do adolescents do? They have a sense of panic. They have a sense of anxiety. They don't think correctly. They're, they can't process information. There's a problem. Or they're acting out in disruptive ways, physically, emotionally, sexually. So what she's describing is sort of a way of thinking about the bigger picture. We cannot slice and dice adolescents into diagnostic categories and think we're dealing with completely discrete, medically equivalent categories. This is the great problem with the DSM. It looks like there are discrete categories. We have depressive dynamics, we have anxiety dynamics, we have sexual dynamics, and it all looks like a medical book wherein the practitioner is putting people in little boxes, and the boxes are separated. In a medical field, if you go to an internist, you can have a sore throat, you can have a sprained ankle, you can have a broken arm. These things are obviously completely unrelated to each other, and you would deal with them differently. Different symptoms, different etiology, different medical dynamic. An appendectomy has blood tests and, and other kinds of palpitations that can sense the expanded appendix. You have a certain medically approved process for dealing with a specific medical condition. There is nothing like that in mental illness. The DSM is designed primarily to acquire medical legitimacy by mimicking that medical process the problem is it's working with the human mind, which doesn't fit in nice, neat categories. We have an overarching way of experiencing things that derive from our sense of self in the world, but that's a really difficult idea. It's a vague concept. Teenagers act out uh, disruptively. They have a sense of inner panic that generates behavior because they experience things uh, in ways that they cannot handle. And they do it in very different ways depending on their particular family constellation, their particular developmental history. But we as clinicians and as parents must recognize that our children can't be compartmentalized into nice neat little boxes where discrete symptom packages can be dealt with as if 
It's a clean, external, physiological, biochemical, neurological problem, which we can apply a little medication to and be done with. The human mind does not work that way, and anyone that approaches teenage, adolescent behavioral issues with that model will be part of the problem and not part of the solution. Panic and disruption are familiar to any experienced worker, but may not have been seen, may not have been seen as signals of distress. That's it, folks. Adolescent behavior is a signal of distress. It is the acting out of internal dynamics in a way that is screaming for attention sometimes, sometimes literally. The issues of adolescent behavior are issues of distress. We cannot treat behaviors as if they are discrete symptoms. We have to look to the meaning of those symptoms to understand the unconscious and developmental history of those symptoms or there is no chance of fixing the problem. I'll get back to this in a minute, but this is a, a perfect time to, to be clear. If you don't diagnose the problem correctly, you cannot fix it. Everyone knows this when you take your automobile to the mechanic. The first thing the mechanic must do is listen to the engine, listen to the noises, and figure out what's wrong. If you come in with your engine knocking, you don't replace the muffler. If there is a smell coming out of a part of it, you don't change the tail lights unless the taillights are smelling badly for some reason. The idea here is that diagnosis in psychoanalysis in psychoanalytic therapy is exactly this of exactly the same importance if you don't understand what's wrong you cannot fix it if you misunderstand an adolescent's behavior uh, as merely behavior that has to be controlled brought into compliance um, punished perhaps to, to stop the behavior and you don't see that it is a statement of the child's psychological distress you're not going to be able to fix it in fact the overwhelming likelihood are you're going to make it worse. So, the last quote from Docker, the acceptance of responsibility implies the presence of a functioning ego, which is absent in many of these children and adolescents. We have to supply the functioning ego ourselves and to contain and hold the violence and the child together. That, ladies and gentlemen, ought to be the job of the parent, to hold the child together to hold the anxiety, the rage, the anger of the child. The parent's job is to take that in. This is true of babies and mothers, as I've described, I think, fairly clearly in the child development lectures. The baby sends, projects its different, intense emotional dynamics into the mother who metabolizes them, soothes the baby by returning those emotions metabolized into love and care and containment. And the baby is soothed by the presence of the containing mother. She's containing the baby's intense emotional responses. Same thing for the adolescent in a much more complex way, obviously. But the idea is for the parents to be able to hold the violence, hold the emotional response. By violence, I mean intense emotional reaction. And frankly, as well as some of the physiological, physical acting out that adolescents do. The parent's job is to contain that, to recognize its meaning, to recognize when it's a problem that it's a sign of distress. It's a signal. It's, in, it's a plea for help and understanding. And, it's, and it requires the parents to be healthy for them to hear that in the way it actually is. So this is the point where I tell parents, you can't help your adolescent unless you yourself are relatively healthy. There's a metaphor for this. The idea on an airplane when the, the announcement is made, and it is inevitably made in every flight I've ever been on, that parents, if there's a, a depressurization of the cabin, the parents are supposed to put their masks on first before they help their children. Why? It's obvious. An unconscious parent's not a lot of help to the children. Same thing here. A parent who has his or her own issues that are unresolved, a parent who is themselves acting out their own developmental derailments, cannot be in a position to see the truth of their 
children's developmental derailments. That's the intergenerational transmission of trauma. Parents, you must intervene in your own emotional dynamics aggressively. You must get the help you need in order to help the, the children who so far perhaps might have been subjected to this transmission of trauma. It's not your fault. It's not anybody's fault. But the reality of it has to be addressed. I have never, uh, more than half my patients now are adolescents, and I have never once seen an adolescent come into my office who had a problem unrelated to the parent's dynamic. Never happened. I don't think it's ever going to happen. A mental problem, an emotional problem, those are derived from developmental dynamics with the parents. If it's a physiological problem, if it's a question of, of perhaps even brain damage, concussions, uh, mental retardation, things that can be identified specifically as neurological issues, then, then we have an individual diagnostic category that is identifiably physical. Those, ladies and gentlemen, are not 1% of the situations that most therapists deal with. They are clearly medical situations, and virtually no therapist deals with them directly, very rarely. Sometimes they're dealt with in addition to the inevitable emotional dynamics, but therapists understand the difference between mental retardation and mental illness. One is emotional, the other is physiological. So the therapist's job with an adolescent is to do that very thing with both the adolescent and the parents. I don't think it makes any sense for parents with a disturbed adolescent to send their adolescent to therapy and expect the therapist to fix the adolescent when the, ad the therapist must then send the adolescent back into the family systems, back into the family dynamic that generated the problem to begin with. No therapy of an adolescent can work I don't believe, without the active intervention of the therapist in the family dynamic. The parents have to be involved at some level in the therapy. The parents ought to be involved in their own therapy somehow so that we can fix the family system. Without that, it is at best a makeshift. It is a band-aid over a sucking chest wound. That isn't going to work for anybody very long. Okay, so here's how we deal with this. And, and I, I make, I'll come back to this at the end when we, when we spend some time more specifically with the, um, the therapeutic elements of this, but I want to reemphasize it now. Okay, if you've paid attention to what I've been saying, if, if any of that makes sense at all, then what, does, what is the therapist doing? What are they focusing on? And what are they looking at when, a, when they talk about psychopathology? Well, as I've said, they're talking about emotional dynamics. Good therapy and good diagnostic workups of a patient, adolescent or otherwise, will focus on the emotional dynamics in the, the person and the emotional dynamics between that person and, and their key relationships. We cannot be as a primary matter, focused on compliance and control. We may get compliance and control if we've dealt with the emotional dynamics first and foremost. Compliance and control is a derivative of the strength developed through a therapeutic intervention that is designed to strengthen the patient's sense of self, abilities, skills, and, and, and mind so that they can deal with the world in reality, so that the truth of their lives can be handled and managed, so they don't have to be in denial about what's going on within them and around them. So it's an emotion-focused therapeutic intervention, which requires first that there be this idea of benevolent curiosity. I believe the first time that phrase was used was by Ernst Jones back in the 30s, and it made perfect sense to me when I heard it from my own therapist a long time ago, um, and it made sense when I read it in the old texts. It still makes sense. We approach the patient, and I'm suggesting that parents, if they can approach themselves this way, with benevolent curiosity. What, what's going on inside me right now? 
not judgment, not blame, not condemnation, not finger pointing, but oh my God, look what's going on. What am I feeling? Why am I feeling that? What about me? What about my development is evoked in this particular experience? How much of what I'm bringing to the table is about my history, my development? How much of my emotional response is being transferred to the circumstances I'm in versus how much of it is warranted by the reality that I am facing now? That's the question. That's the question of transference that Freud described so well 100 years ago, 110 years ago. The idea that our emotional response has more to do with our own developmental dynamics than it does about the reality we're facing. I see this constantly in my own life and those around me and my patients. The idea is that psychic reality, as Freud said, is more powerful than external reality. So that my reaction, I, and I don't have hard numbers, this isn't science, it's a bit of an art. 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of my emotional response, of your emotional response, of your adolescent's emotional response, has, has to do with their own internal experience, their own subjective emotional dynamics. And half maybe, and as little as 10 percent might be involved in an honest reaction to the reality that they're in. If that's the case, if that's even close to the truth in any individual adolescent or adult for that matter, then they can't function in reality well. And therapy and good diagnosis has to look at a particular pathology with that understanding of the developmental dynamics that formed this particular reaction to these circumstances, that formed a predisposition in the child's mind, in the adolescent sense of self, to responding to threat, to responding to fear, to responding to desire even, in a particular way that says something more about them than the situation they're facing. This goes back to the question of truth. We have to deal with reality. We also have to deal with psychic reality. We cannot just demand that our adolescents um, comply with our demands. We cannot simply impose a blinded control over them and demand that they submit to our will. If we're doing that, we're already wrong. Adolescents definitely need boundaries. But it's up to the parent to impose those boundaries from a place of health and wholeness and integration in themselves. If they cannot do that, they are simply allowing the stuff to roll downhill in the intergenerational transmission of trauma. I do believe that it's the truth, the recognition of an internal experience, the recognition of external reality, the truth of the internal experience, the truth of the external experience that is what heals patients most. The tr <laughs> and and that, that old phrase, the truth will set you free, I think turns out to be profoundly true at levels that no one who has heard that phrase really appreciates. It's, it's one of those superficial little toss-offs, that yeah, the truth will set you free, whatever. But if you step back and look at it psychoanalytically, if you look at it therapeutically, developmentally, it turns out to be the profoundest bits of wisdom. Okay, with that, let us move into the details of psychopathology. Except for one thing. <laughs> we have to talk about divorce for a minute. Uh, perhaps I'll do an entirely separate lecture sometime on single parenting, um, but I think I can subsume most of the details of that important subject into the divorce uh, topic. I can't talk about psychopathology without talking about divorce. I, I don't think I've ever seen an adolescent in my therapeutic practice that wasn't either the child of divorce or the child of difficult, hostile dif uh, parents who themselves had so many issues between the parents that they might as well been divorced because the atmosphere in the home was so difficult the children's needs were long since forgotten. Um, there are there is a woman named Judith Wallerstein who has done the most profound research in divorce anyone in the world's ever done. She's done the longest longitudinal study. It's gone on for 25 or 30 years now. 
Um, no one has come close to this in terms of thoroughness. If there's any science to this at all, if there's any psychoanalytic research that is reliable, it is that uh, written by Judith Wallerstein. It is summarized, and I will get to the details of it very soon, uh, it is summarized wonderfully well uh, in just a, para a long paragraph by Dr. David uh, Scharf and Dr. Jill Scharf. Um, let me summarize that and then go into the details. I quote, In brief, we may note that younger preschool children may suffer acute regression and separation anxiety, turning to transitional objects for support, whereas slightly older preschoolers may be more capable of recognizing sadness and, feelings, and feeling the blow to self-esteem, using play to integrate their experiences. Younger, latency-aged children may become intensely distressed, fearful or depressed, and preoccupied with fantasy and cling or to or reject their parents. The older latency-aged child reacts in a more openly angry way, outraged at parents who have broken the rules, and may become rebellious or perform poorly in school. Often such a child fails to observe socially appropriate conduct with friends who may then shun the upset child. Adolescents, who are best able to comprehend the meaning of their parents' decision, experience a profound sense of loss and worry about the realities of financial support. The phase-appropriate mourning of the loss of the ideal parents of childhood and the dependency and playfulness of earlier years is compounded for them by the additional trauma of the actual loss of the par parents' relationship and of the childhood home. This complicates the adolescent's imminent task of separation from the family and it introduces a worry about the adolescent's own capabilities to form stable sexual relationships. That, in one thick paragraph, summarizes uh, birth to late adolescence, the impact of divorce on child development at every phase of development. Here is the unescapable news that requires great courage on the, on the part of patients. Divorce is child abuse. There is no way around it. There is no way around dealing with the reality of it. There is no way around avoiding looking at the effect on children as primarily the tearing apart of their minds quite literally. Their identities are torn apart. They have up until that point been the child of Mr. and Mrs. X. That union is torn asunder Simultaneously, the child's very identity is itself torn apart. The child's mind is literally torn apart. It doesn't know who it is anymore. If it isn't that, who is it? And that's the source of the various traumatic developmental experiences that Scharf discusses. Uh, that is the hardest thing I've ever had to tell parents. That is the hardest thing for parents to even begin to wrap their minds around because they all believe that it will be better after the divorce. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a delusional lie. It may be better for one of the parents, and it usually is much worse for both parents for a long time. Even if it's better for one parent, it is never, and I don't get to say that very often in this field, it is never better for the children. All right. There are one-sided benefits to some of the parents in divorce situations. The children uniformly suffer. I've had parents repeatedly tell my adolescent patients that it'll be better after the divorce or it'll be better now that we're divorced. They send their children to me because of the emotional trauma that that entails and the resulting behavioral dynamics in school and with peers. And I hear the story of how the parents told one, one or more of their children that it was going to be better now, and I have never met a teenager who believed that for a minute. It's a lie. The teenagers know it's a lie, and they suffer for it on top of the trauma. <sighs> What's interesting is that the, the Wallerstein research also shows that though parents are often in denial, about the trauma they themselves undergo. The reality is that parents themselves are very often not better off for the divorce. That some, it takes as much as two and a half to three and a half years for men and women simply to reestablish some external sense of order. There is no sure recovery for the parents 
Okay. We have parents who themselves are traumatized by the divorce. There's no way around that. A divorce will, and here's the irony, they think they're doing themselves a favor, but most of the time they're simply reacting the parent's own childhood trauma. When they decompensate, when the parents are in so much distress that they have to divorce, who's taking care of the children? The parents will delude themselves into thinking that, they're, that the things will be better for the children. But the problem is they can't take care of themselves. Who's taking care of the children during this long process? And it can be a decades-long process. Divorce activates the most intense passions of adult life. Therefore, inevitably, and this is why divorce is child abuse, there is no way to contain the children when the parents themselves are undergoing the kind of traumatic separations every divorce inevitably means. And I've talked to people who thought that their divorce was fine, that they, it was amiable, it was fine, there was no yelling and throwing of ashtrays, they understood and div divided up the property and the financial responsibilities and sometimes even the, the child rearing and everything's fine and the children's minds are still torn apart. It, I have never seen an exception to that rule. Do some adolescents feel relief in, in the divorce? Yes, a very small percentage do, but those are the ones who have directly observed domestic violence. Those are the ones who recognize that the parental dynamic is so toxic, so violent, that to escape the violence is a relief. But folks, you must understand, a relief from a violent atmosphere is not the same as getting their needs met. That a child might claim that they feel better now that they're not in that home. They may claim that they feel better now that the divorce has happened and the parents aren't doing the terrible things they were doing before. Has no necessary connection to the young adolescent or the child getting their actual developmental needs met. If parents don't recognize the difference between a child's relief at the yelling stopping and what the child, him or herself, needs to develop into a strong, healthy adult, then what we have is nothing less than, the, than child abuse. The, the answer to that is that if I'm a happy parent, I'll be a better parent. And the answer is no, you won't. That isn't a, a necessary correlation. Maybe you're happy, but what kind of a parent will you be then? Will you be able to meet the child's developmental needs? That you're happy may be a useful thing for you, but it doesn't necessarily equate to being a good parent. Maybe you're the same kind of parent you were that generated the divorce in the meantime. Maybe you're the same kind of parent that ended up in a relationship with someone whose pathologies and your pathologies mixed up into this volatile domestic violence situation, and you're still that same person, you're feeling relief because you're out of it, but your relief doesn't mean you're a better parent any more than the child's relief at avoiding the trauma of the family constellation means their needs are being met. This is unpleasant. This is difficult to hear. And here's, I mean, one of Wallerstein's conclusions is, is painfully obvious to me. If the parents of div in divorce think they're meeting their children's needs, they're already wrong. The need that the children have is for the parents to grow up, to get the help they need, to keep the family together, to find true love with each other as you pledged to begin with, to mature to the point where your needs and your partner's needs can be met in a loving relationship and both of you can then focus on the child's needs in an appropriate, true, reality-based way. Parents who are divorcing and claiming they know what the children's needs are are by definition wrong. If they're divorcing, they don't know what the child's needs are. And I think that's the core of the problem. To be specific, children's sense of self, their identity, their ego structure, however you characterize it, is affected in some very specific and traumatic ways by divorce. First, trust is lost. A child who grows up in a family that's stable and consistent and present and loving 
develops a sense of trust in primary relationships. That's where you get trust from, the experience of trustworthy parents. A child of divorce now sees suspicion in everything he or she looks at. Are they really, do they really love me? If their experience is of parental abandonment, you can't expect a child to trust easily or readily. They won't. There's always a compressed sense of time. The idea that the crisis that they have is right now. They're, any crisis a child of divorce has is intensified because their sense of time is compressed. If you've got a problem and you real, if, for example, in a relationship, if two people have been together for a long time and there's a problem, if they're healthy, if they're appropriate, if they've had themselves the experience of a loving relationship, then they look back and say, ah, this is a problem we have now, but there's been a history of loving care and there's hope for the future of loving care. So the crisis is seen in context. Children of divorce no longer have that context. And the crises then become overwhelming much more easily. That lends a sense of chaos to the adolescent's life, adolescence of divorce, that, that, is, that exacerbates, because it's an external sense of chaos. It exacerbates the adolescent developmental chaos that's bad enough all by itself in a loving atmosphere. So we redouble the problems of adolescence in growing up. Betrayed dependence is a phrase. I think that's the same as trust. A feeling of rejection. Here may be the central problem of a child of divorce. Um, and this goes back to children who are neglected, children whose parents aren't present emotionally in an adequate way. This is the fundamental problem of child development. When there's a divorce, when there's a parent or parents who are neglectful of the child's actual developmental needs, the child has two choices, and only two. Either my parents are evil and don't care about me and don't love me, or it's my fault. Even if the reality is the first one, no child can accept that because that would make them insane. That's too much anxiety. That's too much vulnerability. It's impossible. So inevitably, the child takes the responsibility on themselves. Inevitably, the child of divorce assumes that, you know, if, if I was a better boy, daddy would come back. If I was a better little girl, daddy wouldn't be so mad all the time, or the mommy, or whatever. This is the worst of the self-fulfilling prophecies because if the child takes in the experience of their own badness, now they're not bad, it's a lie. It's never the child's fault. There is no divorce in the history of divorce that anyone can point to the child being the cause of it. It's the worst lie the child is ever allowed to tell itself and that's what inevitably happens because the alternative is too terrible. So we get these children assuming it's their fault, assuming they're bad, assuming they're not good enough, assuming they're guilty of something. And guess what happens? In adolescence, if you think you're guilty, if you think you're bad, if you think you don't deserve love and care, you will find someone in your life to treat you badly without care and, and punish you for the guilt you feel like you deserve. This is the source of, I'm going to just throw out an arbitrary number, my best guess, 90% of all teenage acting out is a direct derivative of this lie. And, and teenagers will punish themselves and they'll act bad and they'll get in trouble because they've been put in a dynamic where their badness is the only alternative. If they get punished enough, in fact, they might get mommy and daddy back together. This is the source of most adolescent masochism. If they just suffer enough, everything will be okay. Down that road is, a, is decades of hideous, useless suffering. It has to stop. Anger, powerlessness, loneliness, loyalty conflicts and guilt, all of these things are dynamics that get evoked in divorce situations. Um, one thing I want to mention in particular, in my adolescence I have seen this consistently. The adolescents take in criticism of the parents personally. It, it is so hard in the context of a divorce where all the adult passions get evoked, it's hard for one parent not to blame the other parent in the presence of the children. Parents will generate arguments in front of the children so that they can see 
so that the children can see how righteous that parent is. Well, that's delusional and child abuse in some of its worst forms. What happens is you got to remember child development. The child, every child, takes in its mother and father. Both of those are inside the child. Object relations is correct in the idea that every child takes in the mother and the father. Those objects are within the child. The child experiences itself as a mix of those two people, and they're inside the child, so that when one parent criticizes the other, now it should be obvious, the child hears that as a criticism of a major part of them. No child hears parents dumping on each other as anything other than a direct assault on their own integrity. Imagine the trauma. Imagine the experience of emotional abuse. That's, and I have said this to parents, and I'll say it in the future, if you criticize the other parent to the child, you're committing one of the worst forms of emotional abuse of the child because of the way the child's mind takes it in. You are out of control. You are then the problem. Regardless of whether or not the criticism is justified in the reality of your adult relationship, it may be. But to say that in front of the child is a completely separate issue. It is abusive. It is damaging. It hurts the child. It drives them to psychopathology if it's relentless and it doesn't stop and the recognition of that problem doesn't get healed somehow. At the end of the day, divorce is not a second chance for children. It is the price children pay for parental failure. Oh, my God. That is a traumatic thing to say, and it's a traumatic thing for the children to feel. And it's true, and it has to be dealt with honestly. No, the answer isn't to stay in an abusive relationship. The answer is to grow up. The answer is to get your needs met honestly, recognize how you've been the victim of the intergenerational transmission of trauma, how necessary it is for you to get the help you need, to get the emotional mask over your face so you can help the children. Heal your own issues, become the mature adult you need to be, help your partner do that, and stay together for the children in a healthy, loving relationship. If you can't do that, fine. It's probably the lesser of two evils to divorce rather than continually expose the children to trauma. But it isn't a good thing for the children. It is abuse. All right. Um, let me shift now and move into the, the details of the psychopathology section. Um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 has reorganized itself rather dramatically. Most of the, most of the content is, is similar. There's been some significant changes. But in terms of adolescent development, what they've done is shifted from listing all of the adolescent potential pathologies in one block to um, having some together in ways that, that make sense. But they've sort of spread them out, and one has to go through uh, the entire text, really, to tease out which might be appropriate um, or useful for application to adolescence. Um, all right, I have to get out uh, the most controversial problem first. Going back to what I said before about the differential between the medical model and the diagnostic manual's division of psychopathology of, of mental Ill illnesses or emotional illnesses. There is no adolescent mental illness that isn't a direct derivative of the parental mental illness. And this is the shocking conclusion. There are no, and I say this specifically, and I mean this, and this is what the literature, I believe, supports. There is no biochemical, neurological, or genetic causes of adolescent mental illness. The great lie of modern therapy is the, and the great lie that I think parents desperately are trying to believe is that somehow it is a brain question instead of a mind question. The literature that I have looked at and I have looked at it, everything I get my hands on 
in the child development and adolescent developmental field. You've got to understand the difference between causation and correlation. I'm going to take the position, and I challenge anyone to show me research to the contrary, that there is no causal link between any identifiable neurological brain structure, biochemical, ex, uh, biochemical constellation in the human body, I will challenge anyone to find a direct genetic cause of any of the listings in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5. There is no causal link between any biochemical, neurological, or genetic cause and any adolescent or any other adult or early child mental illness. There are correlations. If this happens, this happens, and they seem to be happening together somehow, but no one has any idea. There's not a shred of scientific laboratory reproducible evidence that can stand the scientific method in its hard equivalent of physics, chemistry, biology, genetics. There is no hard evidence to directly link in a causal way any of these biochemical or neurological structures in the brain or body directly to any behavioral manifestation in the diagnostic manual. This is the great lie of modern psychotherapy. Correlation, we have some, and it's vague and unconnected, and we're not even sure which direction it goes. It's correlational. Two things happen simultaneously, but we don't know what causes the other. What we do know now, through sophisticated MRI, CAT scans, functional MRI, brain scanning technologies, is that love makes your brain grow. That the, that the brain structure of babies who have been neglected is substantially weaker, less neuronal growth, less complex neuronal connections than babies who have been cared for in a loving, healthy environment. That's now no longer in dispute. How then do we determine when that baby grows up What's the cause of its behaviors? Was it the lack of love or was it the brain structure? It turns out you can't even tease these things apart in any clean way anymore. The science has shown the inevitable and intricate dance between nature and nurture, between biology and experience. And so we have to get away from the idea that we can biochemically intervene with adolescent behaviors. We're talking about drugging children for symptoms. We're drugging children for our own failures of parental nurturing. Disturbed adolescents are made, not born. That fact, and I am saying it's a fact, it is science. No one to date has been able to show me a single research project that has resulted in neurological or biochemical or genetic causes of adolescent behavior sufficient to meet the diagnostic criteria of the manual. I look forward to hearing from anyone who thinks they have some, but I require first that you look at the difference between causation and correlation. Okay, so how do we deal with this? We have to recognize the reality that symptom relief is not cure. That's the take-home lesson. Symptom relief is not cure. If I break my arm, I go to the emergency room. They give me morphine. I'm fine. I no longer feel any pain. Am I fine? No, my arm's still broken. They haven't fixed my arm yet. All psychotropic medication is in the same category of event. We may take drugs to make us feel less depressed, less anxious. We may have mood stabilizers. We may have all kinds of psychotropic medication, but it is in that nature. It is fixing symptoms. There is no biological cure for emotional illness. Let me walk through the hierarchy again. I think I've mentioned this uh, earlier. There is biology. Let's start with the body. Let's start with genetics. Developmentally, what comes after that is emotion. 
a six-month-old baby does not have the ability to think in language. They don't have language. They don't have that kind of cognitive function. Do they have emotions? Dramatically intense emotions. Dramatically intense emotions. Everyone that's ever held a baby knows how intense their emotions can be. Only when those emotions are contained, stabilized, held, loved, metabolized into nurturing care and containment, are the baby's emotions stabilized, contained enough, so that thinking can develop out of that. Thinking develops out of a stable emotional context. Out of, a, out of that, perhaps, if we're really lucky, uh, creativity flows. So that's, the, that's the, the hierarchy. Biology, emotion, thinking, creativity. <sighs> Diagnoses in the DSM reflect a failure of the emotional containment. The behaviors, often in terms of cognitive interaction, really are symptoms of emotional dysregulation. Therapy that doesn't deal with the emotional reality cannot fix a symptom, cannot fix the problem, can only deal with, on a superficial level, modifying the symptom. That doesn't fix anything for very long. Okay, let me use the, probably the most profound and important example of them all right off the bat, ADHD. It's gone through several iterations over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, I read recently that over a, a recent five-year period there was something in the neighborhood of a 1700 percent increase in ADHD diagnoses. This is absurd. If it was a flu epidemic of that magnitude, there, there would be federal action and disaster relief. Um, it can't be true that somehow, all of a sudden, there's this pandemic of ADHD everywhere. There appears to be a diagnostic inflation. How is this happening? Well, the answer is go back and look at the criteria for ADHD. It's so vague. It's so general. It can be applied to almost any teenage boy out there. Um, if, if we look at it from one step back, it seems to me that what we have is almost, and I, I use this word with some reserve, conspiracy. Everybody wants this, the young boy and, virtu and, and the majority, the overwhelming majority, of ADHD diagnoses are adolescent boys. Some girls, but most, the overwhelming majority boys. It appears that the teachers, the school counselors, certainly the parents, the administrators, very frequently the internist or psychiatrist dealing with the family issues, everybody wants the behaviors to stop. Everybody wants the symptoms to be contained. And they all think that by containing the symptoms they've fixed the problems, but it absolutely isn't true. In fact, it can actually make the problem worse. What happens what happens when you drug a young teenager? What are you sending them And in terms of a message? You're telling them they're broken. You're telling them they're dysfunctional. You're telling them there's something profoundly wrong with them. And the message they're getting is that they're almost beyond repair. They know the drug doesn't fix them. They know that, that they are barely keeping a lid on things. They, in fact, know that the parents and the adults in their lives are more concerned with order than their developmental needs being met, and that is the very source of the problem to begin with. So we have what ends up being a tendency to use Ritalin and its derivatives to drug young adolescent boys into compliance. There's nothing else that can be said. If there is no biochemical, neurological, or genetic cause of ADHD, if there's no neurological connection to the behaviors, if the checklists remain sort of a, a vague behavioral checklist that's so general it can be applied to almost anybody, then, all, then the, the simple truth here is that what we have are parents and everyone else in the young boy's life trying to get him to stop doing something or get him to do something or obey the rules or sit down and shut up. And nobody is talking about what the child's developmental needs were that didn't get met. 
this is difficult work. It's easier to give them a pill. It's easier to pretend it's not anybody's fault, responsibility, or anything else. One of the real problems I have in my own profession is that it appears that in, in my discussion of my many adolescents who themselves have been diagnosed with ADHD and prescribed medication by uh, a family doctor or a psychiatrist, it turns out that in many cases the interview ba based upon which the, the prescribing healthcare provider issues a script for Ritalin or its derivatives takes about 15 minutes. I have heard this over and over and over again. How how in the name of Freud can any treating physician or psychologist or healthcare provider diagnose a child's mental illnesses in a 15-minute interview? I suspect, no, I fear that that's a level of malpractice that would get uh, med mental health professionals and medical professionals thrown out of the field if they diagnosed on such flimsy medical evidence in a biological event. And I get that it's all, and this is where denial comes in. Parents want a pill to fix the problem. They don't want to do the very difficult work, the long-term work of themselves or their adolescents. And I don't think there's any way around that. And perhaps this plea, this video, and the ones associated with it, at the end of the day, is I'm trying to reach those parents who can handle the truth of that who can recognize the truth that at some level they themselves and their adolescents need more help than the parents can give them and they with tremendous courage, with will and, and bravery and determination reach out to get the help that they ultimately need to help their, their kids. If they, that That's what this is about. My fear is that that's way too small a percentage and maybe if maybe if this material is in any way inspirational I can help those handful of parents that might not have gotten help to do so and to get their kids the help they need okay um, and as if everyone doesn't understand how serious this is let me let me spend a, a minute or two describing directly the functional consequences of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is from the DSM-5, and you've got to listen to this. You've got to recognize what's at stake here. That's why there may be a, a sense of intensity about my, the way I'm presenting some of this material. I may feel a little aggressive about the way I present things. This is why, quote, ADHD is associated with reduced school performance and academic attainment, social rejection, and in adults, poorer occupational performance, attainment, attendance, and a higher probability of unemployment as well as elevated interpersonal conflict. Children with ADHD are significantly more likely than their peers without ADHD to develop conduct disorders in adolescents and antisocial personality disorder in adulthood consequently increasing the likelihood for substance use disorders and incarceration. The risk of subsequent substance use disorders is elevated, especially when conduct disorder or antisocial -person personality disorder develops. Individuals with ADHD are more likely than peers to be injured. Traffic accidents and violations are more frequent in drivers with ADHD. There may be an elevated likelihood of obesity among individuals with ADHD. Inadequate or variable self-application to tasks that require sustained effort is often interpreted by others as laziness, irresponsibility, or failure to cooperate. Family relationships may be characterized by discord and negative interactions. Peer relationships are often disrupted by peer rejection, neglect, or teasing of the individual with ADHD. On average, individuals with ADHD obtain less schooling, have poorer vocational achievement, and have reduced intellectual scores than their peers although there is a great variabil vari variability. In its severe form, the disorder is markedly impairing, affecting social, familial, scholastic, and occupational adjustment. And there's hundreds, if not thousand percent increases in the prevalence of this. It's astonishing. This is a disaster. 
And what's truly frightening about doing adolescent psychopathology is that the functional consequences of the other categories read in a very similar way. We have here, and I don't think I'm exaggerating here, I want to be careful, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but what I'm reading is an existential crisis in adolescence, that we, are, that we are facing a catastrophe here of, of civilizational proportions. Does that sound ridiculous? Does that sound over the top? Am I being sort of end of the world-ish here? I, 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 I don't know. I, I hope not. What I'm looking at is the data and trying to make sense of it. Um, one last detail that I don't think is a small thing. Um, there has been uh, endless um, internet um, commentary, there's endless numbers of books about the psychopathologizing of masculinity. And we now, I, I think even parents that I've discussed with this with for years, are virtually in unanimous agreement that I have heard that they recognize that something very is, is wrong with the way our young boys are being treated in adult, in elementary school, middle school, and high school. We are emasculating them. We are desexing them. We are punishing natural male behaviors, male style, and male energy. We are feminizing, in some ways, our young boys. And when they don't act in accordance with this new, frankly, call it feminized, way of interrelating, we drug them into mindless compliance. There's something wrong with that, I think. Now, that sounds a little, uh, I sound a little like a flamethrower there. Um, I wonder how many of you, when you heard that, sort of go, wow, that's, that's really intense, or that's too much. And a little part of you didn't go, yeah, yeah, he's on to something there. I've seen that. I've seen something like that. Our boys can't play dodgeball anymore. They can't pick sides anymore. They can't play tag. They can't do anything. Sports teams are being eliminated. They can't wrestle. They can't do football. Gymnastics is being destroyed across the board. They can now play soccer and basketball and, and frisbee, apparently, in most schools these days. And it's because, it seems in part, that there is a a cultural ideology that pathologizes traditional male experience. And this is way beyond the scope of a, of a lecture on adolescent psychopathology, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention it, that it seems to be a problem at a much higher level. On the theory that if you don't diagnose the problem right, you can't fix it, if we continue to stay focused on individual adolescent behaviors, and we do not address the pathologizing influence of some of our new school policies, we're going to throw the teenagers back into the very atmosphere that's generating their behavior to begin with. We can't put an adolescent back in a family that's causing the poisonous behavior. We can no more put a child back in a schoolroom that's causing the pathological behavior. And I believe there's a fair amount of that going on. Um, it varies, of course, but I challenge you to take a good close look at what your children are being put through and make conscious choices about their developmental needs. Okay, um, ADHD is a category all by itself. It's so prevalent, it's so powerful, it's so important, it has to be looked at directly and at some length. There are other disorders, lots of them, uh, that may be applicable to adolescents. The next category that seems most populated are the various learning disorders. Now I can summarize most all of them. They are, there are many different learning disorders in the DSM and there are simply variations, they seem to me, to be variations on the theme. You can have a learning disorder uh, around a dozen different possible academic subjects, but overall they all seem to be coming from the same place. They are anxiety disorders. We cannot think because we're scared. Children who have emotional dysregulation because of uncontained anxiety, of course can't think. How they can't think depends on their individual circumstances, but the problem is excess anxiety. Uh, if it isn't addressed at that level, it isn't going to be helped. All right, now I need to get, uh, there's four different 
um, diagnoses, diagnostic categories that I, I sort of lumped together. Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, and intermittent explosive disorder. And they are, um, they seem to be almost interchangeable. The, the categories, the, uh, the behavioral checklist under each of them could almost be, almost, be uh, interchangeable and it would be hard to tell the difference. Let me start with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. The definition is fairly straightforward. Temper outbursts, verbal or behavioral, that are grossly out of proportion in intensity or duration to the situation or provocation. That's it. The details follow in checklists below that, but that's the core of it. And it seems quite obvious. That makes sense, doesn't it? Well, if you have temper outbursts, verbal or behavioral, that are grossly out of proportionate in intensity or duration to the situation of the provocation, well, obviously there's a serious problem. It makes perfect sense, and so we can move on. Except, wait a minute. Let's go back and take a look at that and look at the situations that the children are, are in. And I take this next quote from a, a site called The Last Psychiatrist. He says, I think it's a he, I'm not sure. Quote, I'd like someone to explain what behavior is grossly out of proportion for a situation characterized by physical or sexual abuse, parental drug and alcohol use, extreme neglect of basic physical needs and basic emotional needs, endless hours in warehouse-like daycare, latchkey situations, etc., etc., etc. He goes on. This sounds like poverty. Okay, so what kind of tantrum is out of proportion for a situation characterized by marital infidelity, overparenting, spoiling them materially and depriving them emotionally? What is out of proportion to a narcissistic or depressed parent who just can't be bothered or does not care? I think all four of these categories ex are experienced by the children, by the adolescents, because of those things. And their behaviors are a signal, are a message, are a sign of distress in the adolescent that is directly proportional to the catastrophic developmental failures they have experienced with their parents. Conduct disorder. A repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others or major age-appropriate societal norms or rules are violated. Again, on the surface, that sounds perfectly reasonable. A repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others or major age-appropriate societal norms or rules are violated. Well, we can't have teenagers violating the basic rights of others. We can't have them violating age-appropriate societal norms or rules. That's just not acceptable. There's obviously something wrong with these young children. Wait a minute. Before we go on, <laughs> for the last 40 or 50 years, our entire culture has undergone a revolution of, of civilizational values, of, of cultural values. Everything to do with sexuality, gender, masculinity, not to mention religion and morality, has been attacked shredded, deconstructed. We have now not societal norms and rules. We have diversity and multiculturalism, which denies the existence of any universal societal rules and norms. We have instead a radical subjectivity and a relativism. Well, wait a minute. What does that mean then? What does societal norms and rules mean if there aren't any or hardly any left what we have in these four rather serious categories of psychopathology is whatever the parents don't like. <laughs> if the parents don't like what the child is doing, if the personal subjective predilection of the mental health professional doesn't like what they're doing, feels like they're de denying societal norms or rules, they get shoehorned into a rather dramatically drastic sounding category. <laughs> It's, it's painful. It's painful to see kids whose behaviors that are being described here in what perhaps 50 or 60 years ago would be an understandable formulation. But the very people that wrote these formulations, the, the interpreters of the DSM-4, now DSM-5, the folks who wrote these as a group, the, the, 
the psychological community, the MDs, the psychiatrists, the psychologists, who are responsible for this book, which is effectively the Bible of psychopathology in America, themselves as a group are politically completely bought into the multiculturalist diversity, radical subjectivity, and relativism school. They themselves have long since overcome any assumption that societal rules and norms should be followed at all. They are radical French postmodernists for the most part. It's an astonishing thing to see them use character, character traits and explanations that almost no one in the field believes anymore. We have a horrible example of how very serious labels can be put on adolescents out of subjective opinion and not good data. Let's uh, look at oppositional defiant disorder. Whether the frequency and intensity of the behaviors are outside a range that is normative for the individual's developmental level, gender, and culture. Same idea. What's normative? My field has rejected normative standards for the last 40 or 50 years. Intermittent explosive disorder. Grossly out of proportion to the provocation or any precipitating psychosocial stressors. Go back to the comment that the last psychiatrist meant on, uh, on poverty. I'd like someone to explain what behavior is grossly out of proportion for a situation characterized by all those bad things. Well, if a child of divorce, if a child of poverty, if a child of cultural collapse is acting out in a particular way, how is that behavior grossly out of proportion? The precipitating psychosocial stressors are horrid trauma beyond the average adolescent's ability to endure. It sounds like doing those things would be, if looked at honestly, perfectly understandable in those contexts. I, I find this stuff almost painful to read and painful to think about. It's not helpful, I don't think. Okay. Those are the worst examples. Let's go back, let's uh, move forward to uh, those who I think are probably more accessible to most people. The first is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, you could argue that the collection of symptoms most children come to a therapist with, a, a child who has, has, for example, been through a divorce, are not hard to shoehorn into the PTSD category. I think what we find is the symptoms generated by divorce are inevitably going to easily be fit into an ADHD category or a PTSD category. If divorce is child abuse, if it's traumatically tearing apart the mind of the child, then of course it will fit nicely into the PTSD rubric. Moving forward, major depressive disorder, dysthymia, which is a mild ongoing depression, or the more serious bipolar disorder. Um, we see these in adolescents all the time, and we see them in adolescents for the same reasons we see them in, in adults. I'm going to refer, I don't want to give the lectures all over again, I will refer parents and adolescents to my four or five lecture series on psychopathology. I cover depression rather thoroughly there. Um, there is a series of anxiety disorders, separation anxiety disorder, social anxiety, social phobia. These are also parallel in that they appear to be the dynamics that adolescents act out when they are drenched in anxiety. These are anxiety disorders. The separation anxiety disorder, I think by definition, has its core in an experience of the baby or young child in traumatic separations, emotional or physical, from its parents, specifically the mother. Social anxiety disorder or social phobia appear to be mostly adolescent reenactments of separation anxiety disorder. The same sort of thing now in the context of the adolescent's older life. Um, I think these days I would be remiss if I didn't talk about addictions. Um, drug use, alcohol use, but also the new, newer categories of addiction. Pornography, sexual addiction, um, gambling addiction, and the, 
almost any behavior, I suppose, these days can be seen of as an addiction if it's done in a way that generates pain and suffering and a sort of compulsive compulsivity around its, its, the behaviors. But addictions also represent, in a way that feels similar to major depressive disorders and the various anxiety disorders, the addictions feel like the adolescent is attempting to self-medicate, to soothe anxiety, to fill an empty depressive place. Whether it's with sex or whether it's with alcohol or various drugs these days, the distinct impression I get from my adolescent patients and the, most of the literature on this subject is that those, those kind of behaviors, those kind of acting out behaviors are attempt to self-medicate all of the problems we've already been talking about. It isn't, it isn't just an addiction. And this is one of the areas where my field, I think, is most clearly bought into some kind of medicalized, neurological, biochemical response. And I will say it again, there is no neurological, biochemical, or genetic evidence that any adolescent addiction or any addiction of anybody can be directly causally linked to any of those biologically based structures, brain, body, or otherwise. Love to see the data, haven't seen it yet. Until we get that kind of hard scientific data, the assumption has to be the only thing left is an emotional dynamic that, generate, that is generated by developmental derailment. I would add one thing to the addictions and adolescence, however, and this is central. The neurological research does show that adolescent brain development is not complete until as long as 22, 24, 25, 26 years old uh, with males. Uh, girls, uh, females mature a little quicker. Um, but let's just, for the sake of argument, say that brain development generally isn't complete until the early to mid-20s. What we have in adolescence that we do not have in adults is the extra compounding problem of any substance interfering not just with the functionality of the brain as it does in adulthood. A 40-year-old drinking heavily has certain physiological functions that we have to deal with. In addition, an adolescent who drinks heavily has not only those same functions, but a complication in that the brain itself is still growing. And we do not know exactly yet how the various substances, poisons, toxins that adolescents take in nowadays, drugs and alcohol, affect that unfinished development. I, I don't think you have to make much of a stretch at all. I don't think you have to be sort of over the top or too aggressive or hysterical to make the claim that brain development is so central to adolescent maturing. Brain development. Now I'm talking brain development now, not emotional development. Brain development itself. The fundamental bedrock, biology, upon which the emotions develop and upon which thinking develops after that. The fundamental bedrock of our existence is poisoned by chemicals in the adolescent body and brain that will inevitably to some degree derail that adolescence development. There was a, a recent study out of Australia that talked about consistent drug use, marijuana specifically, marijuana drug use by a bunch of Australian teenagers and what they found is that Shocking. The teenagers who were using today's marijuana, the stuff with an astonishingly high THC content, dropped six to eight IQ points, and those six to eight IQ points were never recovered. I think more tests need to be performed. I think more studies need to be done to confirm this. But what the data suggests, at least initially, um, I always prefer to see multiple follow-up uh, parallel research before I say a conclusion is, is valid scientifically. But what it suggests is that daily marijuana use, at the very least, makes you stupid. <laughs> Isn't this the stereotype? Is, is, is this a case where the stereotype actually um, makes some sense uh, in reality that the, 
the stereotype of the of the addled stoner uh, has some validity to it in in scientific research, it would appear so, and I think this kind of a discussion um, allows that to make some sense. That the brain development is derailed in the adolescents who use medication inappropriately, who use drugs inappropriately. Um, probably don't have time now to discuss the long-term um, effects of borderline narcissistic structural disorders. That's beyond the scope of, of this lecture and I think unnecessary for my purpose today, but that should be looked at by any clinician and by any parent who sees significant behavioral problems with an adolescent. And I mean uh, stuff bordering on the, well, borderline or even psychotic. Um, I'd like to take a short break now and come back to discuss at some length a couple of the more important topics. Uh, lastly, uh, anorexia and bulimia. That's um, that has to be addressed directly along with psychotherapy. So short break and we'll be right back. Thank you.